A little taken, um, Jerry uh, said a young man. Um, I'm not sure who he was referring to. <laughs> it's all relative. <laughs> Before my, my father's sister passed away some years ago, she would remark that my father was a, he's still young. My father at the time was 87. <laughs> My aunt was 100, so it's all relative. <laughs> but thank you, Jerry. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you this morning. I'm Steve Knight. My wife, Christy, came along with me. We are with the International Mission Board and have served in Southeast Asia for the past 18 and a half years. We are in the landing phase, moving toward retirement with the board. We will finish at the end of October. We are currently staying in McDonough, not far away. We are Florida natives, but have not lived in Florida in over 30 years. But we chose this area because there was something available. That's the simple reason. But we have stayed in Georgia a number of times and enjoyed our times in Georgia. Our daughter lives in Marietta, our son in Greenville, South Carolina. They are, of course, adults. Um, but our background is kind of varied. My wife married a bank auditor, so I have a background in business and banking and accounting as she does. And then God called me into the ministry. I was a pastor for eight years, and then we have spent the last 18 years quite literally on the other side of the world, 12 hours away from here and have enjoyed living in the tropics, not far from the equator, where it's summer, 365. And <clears throat> it's been a, a joy for what God has allowed us to be a part of there. But I wanted to express our gratitude to you as a church that gives to and supports the cooperative program and the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, because we are freed from returning to the states to ask for support the way all other missionaries and relief workers are obligated. The, United, the Southern Baptist Convention is unique in its way of funding mission work. There is no other organization like it. It does it cooperatively so that churches like yours, which is small, are able to have a meaningful part. Otherwise, what could you do? Just to give a little example, when we went out years ago, they told us, the board did, that it takes $30,000 just to get a family on the field, let alone support them throughout the year. So that's, so it's, a, it's an overwhelming thing, plus all the expertise, all the process that goes into that. But we're grateful for your contribution to that because it really does make a difference. And as I shared a few weeks ago, with another very small congregation in Florida. It's amazing what a small church or a group of small churches can do because we know of some in Mississippi who began praying for an unreached people group in our island where we lived. And they are like you. They can't support a missionary but as it turns out, because God had really put on their hearts, they began to pray that the gospel would reach this unreached people group. Today, this group of churches helps support a local church planter that we, whom we know. And that's amazing. That's incredible. That's wonderful because no one else had that people group on their radar, in their prayers. And so it's amazing what God can do when we, even as a small group, come together and try to see what God's purposes are. But we're grateful and we express our thanks to you for your support, making it so much easier for us. And with that in mind, we are, it's not, it's not an empty boast. Some of our leadership has told us we are the best trained, the best compensated, the best supported missionaries in the world. So thank you for what you do. Don't consider it to be of no account. Because even if the little that you give seems so minuscule and seems so insignificant, it actually comes together 
to be a part of a big thing that God has done through Southern Baptists cooperatively. That's one of our big key phrases, cooperative. We do it cooperatively. We do it together because the vast majority of Southern Baptist churches are just like Gatesville Baptist. They're not very big. But together, great things. God does. Well, before we begin, I want in the word of God, let's again go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, great are you. And great is your glory. And great your praise among all peoples. And we thank you for the privilege that you give us. As your children, called out of darkness into light. Called children of God. That we can come to you and pray to you. We can come and hear your word and believe and know that you have a word for us. You, the God who created all things out of nothing. And holds, upholds all things by the word of your power. Through Jesus our Lord. And it is him we praise. It is him we desire to be lifted high. The word who became flesh. And the word who still speaks to us today. And we ask, O oh Lord, incline our hearts. To your testimonies and not to dishonest gain. Not to empty things. And we pray this morning, open our eyes to behold wonderful things from your word. And we ask an eager expectation in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I trust that even down this far south, you have still probably have a team that you might like to support representing the state of Georgia. Where we were actually... Some of our colleagues are actually from a little bit north of here. And, of course, they are Georgia fans. But one of them is a betrayer because he likes Auburn. And then there are a number of people in our organization that like that team over in Alabama. <laughs> Not Auburn, but Alabama. But the thing is, it comes to mind, shows something of the commonality among people is that the people over there that we minister to they are just like Americans they have their sports team it's not football it's actually they call it football but it's not American football it's soccer and when they watch it's incredible how excited they get and some of our earliest experiences when we were new in country probably two or three in the morning quiet in our neighborhood, still, hardly a sound. And then all of a sudden, people started screaming and hollering. We thought, what in the world? We got up the next morning. Oh, there was a big international soccer tournament. <laughs> and so at two or three in the morning, because of the time difference, they're up watching it, screaming at the top of their lungs. Spectator sports. We know what that is. You watch, you don't play. <laughs> there is something there to see in that, though, as a lesson, and that is that the Christian faith is not a spectator sport. And yet, a lot of times, that's kind of what we have made it. We see it, we look at it afar from what it really should be. But let us look in Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to read the first three verses. But only focus really on the first two. We are in a race. We are in a struggle as believers in Jesus Christ. Every day. Not just sometimes. Not just as we see maybe cultural hostilities rising as we do today. It's always been going on from the very beginning. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 through 3 which of course follows on the heels of the great chapter, chapter 11, the, the hall of fame of faith. Those many who went before. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Since, therefore, since we also have such a large crowd of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, 
keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, so that you won't grow weary and give up. We must run with perseverance the race that lies before us. We must. It's not an option. But the question then arises, how can we run the race that lies before us? How? What does that mean? You might say, well, I read my Bible. I pray. I go to church very faithfully. I'm doing those things that seem expected of me. Is that enough? Isn't that enough? Well, maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. But let us consider what the race is and what we need to do. For the first thing, of course, in a sermon we have three points. But the first thing we want to think about is we need spiritual awareness. We need spiritual awareness. Now, what do I mean by that? We are destined to run this race. And that last phrase in verse 1, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Are we truly aware of that? Do we live like that is what life is about? My wife probably gets tired of hearing this illustration. I've used it in more than one message. And it comes from an experience that she had with a coworker many years ago. A friend of ours, she, many years ago when we were first married, my wife and a friend of hers worked in an office that was just out in the parking lot from a mall. And at lunch every day, our friend Sandy would take her lunch break. She went into the mall. She liked perfume. She walked by the perfume counter in the store and she'd take a bottle of that stuff and spray herself with it and go on in the mall. <laughs> Well, that was okay for a while, but one day she was a little bit not aware of what she was picking up. And she sprayed herself not with perfume, but with hand lotion. And so she had a big glob of white on her clothes because she didn't spray herself. She sprayed her clothes. And she walked through the mall with this big glob of hand lotion on her before she realized what she had done. And then, of course, she went into the bathroom, she washed it all off, and she had a big wet spot. And she returned from lunch. And without my wife saying anything, she said, don't say a word, don't ask any questions, don't say anything. <laughs> but if we go through life, we can go through the motions, we can do what we do every day, the same things, without really having the awareness of what reality is. And the reality is that we are in a race. A race to the end. And that race is of eternal importance. It's also described in other places, such as in 1 Timothy 6, as a struggle. Paul says, fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called. But the question still comes, so... Exactly what are you talking about? What is the race? What is the struggle that we are in? It is the battle of the ages. It is the battle for our souls. It is the conflict between light and darkness. Between truth and the lies that are perpetrated by the evil one. It is the battle of the ages. And when did it begin? It began in the Garden of Eden. From the very beginning when the old serpent of old tempted the first people and they succumbed to the temptation, they disobeyed God, they rebelled against God, they took the forbidden fruit. And since that time, we are all born with this nature, this sinfulness to do evil. But God has triumphed over Satan in the great turning point of history, all history, when Jesus came as a man, the Son of God, to be like us, and was rejected. He suffered, 
And of course, as we know, he died on the cross in our place as our substitute to bear our sins and then rose on the third day. And that is the decisive thing because in it, Satan is defeated, sin is defeated, death is defeated. Because sin and death, uh, death was the punishment for sin from the beginning for all who disobey. And that is everyone, except those who come to faith in Jesus and put their trust and hope in him. And since that time, there is this ongoing struggle, as Revelation 12 tells us, Satan is defeated. He was cast out of heaven, and he knows that his time is short, and he makes war with the disciples of Jesus Christ. He is defeated. The victory has been won. But the struggle goes on because it is being worked out, it is being fleshed out in your life and mine as followers of Jesus every day in how we live. Are we walking in victory or not? Are we aware of this struggle that's ongoing? Are we really running in the race or are we just watching from the sidelines? Because it's important we, that we see Watching from the sideline is really not an option. Why? Because God has predestined us to run in the race to the end until we finish. And he gives us the grace to finish the race and finish well. Are we aware? Are we fighting? Are we struggling in the strength that God supplies? Or are we kind of watching? Are we just spectators? Reminds us of the night before the night of Jesus, the night before Jesus' crucifixion, when he took his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane and he went there to pray and he said, Stay here and pray, watch and pray. The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. And Jesus went a little distance away and fell on the ground and he prayed and he struggled and he agonized. And what did his disciples do? They fell asleep. Oh, they were tired. They were exhausted. All that was coming down was very stressful for them. And they succumbed to it. Are we doing the same thing? Oh, you don't understand. I have so many things I have to think about right now. My health is declining. I have all these problems. I have all these burdens. We all do. And at some times we have more than we have at other times. But the struggle goes on nonetheless because all the things that we face in this life, however big they may be, and sometimes they are absolutely overwhelming, nonetheless, the struggle of good and evil, of light and darkness continues on whether or not we are really paying attention. And if we do not remind ourselves and stay aware that this is the big thing, this is the big picture, this is of ultimate and eternal importance, we shall find ourselves defeated. And we shall find that we are not experiencing the salvation that God has intended. We need spiritual awareness. We're in a struggle. We're in a race. And we have need to remember that even though we have to focus most of our time and attention every day on things that pertain to life in its momentary character now, we still have need to remember that there's something that's bigger. And that bigger is the race that we are in. But the second thing we need to bear in mind is we need spiritual preparation. And that's what he exhorts us here, also in verse 1. Let's look again. Therefore, since we have such a large crowd of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. We need preparation. We need to be free from every hindrance, an obstacle or weight. In the next month or so, the Olympics will commence once more. Have you ever studied or learned anything about the history of the Olympics it was actually the beginnings of it was going on at the time that the New Testament was written. The Greeks were the great athletes who began the Olympiad. 
And they did not, com they competed similarly, but rather differently. Of course, we have a lot of events today that they did not. But running, of course, was one of them. And the athletes competed a little bit differently. For the ancient athletes competed naked. The human form, the male body was idealized, but there was also something more to it than that. When they competed, they wanted to be free from every kind of of hindrance and obstacle. Now, if you think about it, most, a great many, certainly the summer Olympics, the athletes, their clothing, like when they run, they don't wear long pants and long sleeves. They wear stuff that's really small and tight because they don't want anything that's going to hinder their movement. We also have need to put aside everything that might hinder our spiritual movement. And that pictures for us something of what we are to think of here, along with the background. For in that first phrase, notice he says, since we also have such a large crowd of witnesses surrounding us. Maybe some of us, if we had to compete athletically, or if we do exercise, we probably like to do it when there aren't a lot of people to watch, maybe, because they see that we don't move quite as well as we used to, or maybe we never, even if we're young, don't have a whole lot of athletic ability. I never did. I was always very clumsy as a kid, and so athletic stuff was, I tried to play baseball some. It was really embarrassing, but... <clears throat> He wants us to think of ourselves as though we are maybe like in a stadium. And there is this great crowd. It's full of people. But who are they? Who is watching? It's the people from that previous chapter in chapter 11, the Faith Hall of Fame. Those people who went before like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, even Rahab. All of those people who went before, who had their own race, their own struggle that they fought by faith. And they are, as it were, all about us watching. And they're cheering. Come on. I want to see you win. Yes. Keep going. Keep fighting. They are the ones watching. And they're urging us on. But then... We want to come back to the text and notice, he says, what does he tell us to do? He says, lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily entangles us. We'll look at sin first, the sin which so easily entangles us. When you and I were saved, that may go back a long time, probably does for many of us. What was our motivation? Why did we want to be saved? Was it just to join the church because everybody else did, because our families did. Maybe it was a fear of hell. Maybe we heard a sermon about hell and the awful torments that it is. There are good and legitimate motivations. Well, I, I want to go to heaven when I die. And those things are fine. Those are legitimate. But there might be some that are a little bit higher still. When the angel appeared to Joseph... Before Jesus' birth, he said, he told him what his name was to be. He said, you are to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. God's intention in salvation for us is to save us from our sins. Not just from the punishment of sin that we deserve, but from the power and dominion of sin. So that we who were created in God's image could know and relate to God. And be saved from sin so that as we who were created in God's image might reflect God's glory again. Because people who are sinful cannot do that. And so in chapter 12, also in verse 14, we are urged, pursue peace with everyone and holiness. Without it, no one will see the Lord. Holiness. That is what God wants to accomplish in us now. 
holiness. And what is that? He wants to make us to be more like Jesus, who was the perfect man. The man who never sinned. The man who reflected God's glory, the image of God perfectly in his attitudes, in his actions, in all that he did. And God wants us to be like that. We cannot remain in sin, brothers and sisters. God has predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. And that's not merely something future only. God wants that to begin now in us to shape us, to remake us, so that we might be like Jesus Christ, the perfect man. And that sin that we still commit is something that hinders us in our running. What is the response to the gospel? It is one of faith. It is one of repentance. We repent of sin. We turn from sin. And not just a sin, but all sin. And it means that you and I, as believers in Jesus, as Christians, are lifelong repenters. We keep on repenting all the time. We have to repent every day. And so that is something, that is the expression, the theological doctrinal expression, way we say, of laying aside that sin that entangles us. It keeps us from running. So what is that sin in us that we need to lay aside? Each of us will have to pray and wrestle and ask God to help us to see what that is. To focus on one at a time. Putting it aside. Maybe it's an pro- attitude of pride. Maybe it's harshness with others. Or whatever it is. The sin that so easily entangles. But the second thing is, let us, that he actually says first, is that we are to lay aside every hindrance. What is a hindrance? Many Christians will ask questions after they come to faith. Is it okay if I do this? Is it okay if I watch Netflix? Is it okay to play online games? Is it okay with God if I... Dot, dot, dot. (laughs) Those represent hindrances. And what do I mean? Are those things wrong? The question is the problem. We're talking about running in a race. And running in a race, we want to be freed from every hindrance. And the sin that so easily entangles, anything that keeps us from running and running fast and running our best. So we're asking the wrong question. If we're saying, can I do this? Is it okay? Because what we're asking is, what can I get away with? What, what's permissible? Well, maybe we ought to be asking, what helps me run faster? <laughs> what helps me believe and trust in Jesus more? That's the kind of question. What will help me grow more to be like Christ? That's a good question. Because that is more intentionally positive rather than what can I do and still be okay with God? Rather, let's ask, how can I run and run faster? This is the part of the preparation. Because we must be able to run with perseverance. How can I run farther? How can I run faster? Are there any runners in here? Hey, amen. I used to. (laughs) A long time ago, I get it. I have an artificial hip now, and I could run. But I have chosen not to return to that. But running is fun. I enjoy running. You know, when you first get out there and you're not warmed up, it doesn't feel very good. But then once you get warmed up, it starts to feel good. And you just feel like, I want to keep going and going and going and going. When you're a runner, even if you're not running in a race, you want to see what will help you run faster. What will help you run farther rather than how little can I do? (laughs) Can I just jog around the block and be done with it? No. We want to run farther and faster. Because the race of the Christian life, brothers and sisters, is more than the jog around the block. It's a long haul. 
It's more like a marathon. I've never ran a marathon. But you can be sure if you tried to run that far one time, wow, it takes a lot out of you. What will keep you going? Because after a while, yeah, it feels good. And then the feeling good maybe continues, but maybe your joints and your feet are telling you, you need to rest. You need to stop. But you say, I just want to go farther. I want to go a little farther. What are the things that are the things that keep us from running? We have a lot of distractions. And our world today is so filled with distractions and clutter, news, politics, online games. What we need, brothers and sisters, is an uncluttered life. And that's a struggle because there are so many things that are vying for our attention all the time. All the time. Many of us may need to unclutter our lives and our habits. I have a friend. This friend I told of earlier, her mother was also quite a story. Her mother lived down the block from my parents. And this lady was retired. She lived by herself. She was a widow. And she liked to go to yard sales And if she saw that somebody had put something out at the street that still looked semi-usable, she took it home. And she bought it at yard sales. And the end result was clutter to the utter most. Her house, you walked in and you could walk in this room. There was just a path. And on either side, from the floor up to the ceiling, was all the stuff. I mean, she had, you know, 10 toasters and all kinds of stuff that she could never possibly use. Her house was so cluttered. It was a fire hazard. It turns out she had to have some surgery and she was in the hospital for a time. And as soon as she went in the hospital, her daughter said, I just got to deal with this. She brought in dumpsters. They filled, what, three dumpsters? Seven dumpsters full of stuff and her house was not a big house (laughs) it was not a very big house but it was so full of junk it was all cleaned out they she had it painted she had it cleaned up she had it refurnished she went to rooms to go filled it with new furniture and then held her breath oh what was mom gonna say when she came home and found her house so turned around She was afraid she might be angry. But her mother walked in and she said, my house, my beautiful house. She was happy. It had overwhelmed her. She had done it herself, but was overwhelmed by the problem that she could not deal with it. Maybe we need to unclutter. Do we have some things that are It's good. Maybe it's good. Maybe it's helping us in some ways. But maybe it's really hindering us from running in this race. Unhindered. We need, we must have spiritual awareness. We are in a race in which we are to be running and we must run and we must finish. And we need spiritual preparation, which is that we need to lay aside sin We need to lay aside any kind of hindrance. It may be a very legitimate thing. But if it's keeping us from running, we want to put it aside. And then finally, we want to focus on Jesus. We need to focus. He is the source and perfecter of our faith. Again, verse 1. Therefore, since we have such a large crowd of witnesses surrounding us, they're watching us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. Why is Jesus at the point? Why is he at the end of the race? Well, we want to think about what this book of Hebrews is about. Because the writer, we don't really know who it is. 
is trying to urge some Hebrews, some Israelite believers. They had come to faith, but they were thinking about going back to their old religion and abandoning their faith in Jesus. They had met with some opposition. They had met with some difficulties. They were thinking about going back. And the writer is trying to persuade them that don't go back because what Jesus has offered us is better. Jesus is a better mediator than Moses. Jesus brings a better covenant than the covenant of Moses. There are better promises in this covenant than in the other one. And the sacrifices are better. They had heard the gospel. They were looking back to the former. And so he says in verse 2, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfect perfecter of our faith we don't have the same background as those people but we might have a temptation we might experience a temptation to think about kind of sliding back into our old ways our old sinful habits tempted to go back to a life that's in rebellion against God in spite of what Jesus has done The truth is, Jesus is the prize of our salvation. He is our reward. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. God, above whom there is no one greater, gave us his own son whom he loved. What if we were to be asked to give our own child? There's no one greater than Jesus. This book begins, Long ago, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. This Jesus is God the Son, the Creator, the Sustainer, Almighty. And He is worthy of our worship. But the question may arise in this connection. Why did He have to come as man into the world? Why did Jesus have to become like us? And this is a good thing for us to know. It isn't just some high-flying theological concept. Because truly it relates to who he is and why he had to come and how that impacts us. In the beginning, so God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. But what happened afterward? The first people gave into the temptation of the serpent, Satan, and sinned and fell, and that likeness to God was ruined. But God in Mercy predestined that Jesus would come. God condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering. Jesus had to be made like us in all things to redeem us because he could not redeem what he was not like. And how was he made like us? Besides that he was born as human, he was tempted. Jesus really experienced temptation just like we did, except that he did not sin. From Hebrews 2, but we do see Jesus made lower than the angels for a short time so that by God's grace he might taste death for everyone, crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. For in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was appropriate that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, should make the source of their salvation perfect, through sufferings. Jesus is the perfecter of our faith. He was made perfect. But wait. I thought Jesus was sinless. He is. So why does it say that he had to be made perfect? In what sense was Jesus made perfect? He had to be made like us in everything. That means he had to really experience our weaknesses. Jesus got hungry. He got thirsty. Jesus was tempted. So he could really identify with what you and I feel as human beings. Except that 
Even in temptation, he did not sin, proving that he is the Son of God. So he is a perfect Savior. In other words, had Jesus not really experienced what you and I experience as human beings in terms of hunger, weariness, thirst, and especially temptation, he could not save us. But because he has experienced those things in his incarnation, becoming like us as humans, he is a perfect Savior. And so, the writer to the Hebrews would urge us, fix your eyes on him. Remember him. He has experienced what you experience. When you are weak, when you are overwhelmed, when you are tempted, Jesus has experienced what you and I have experienced. And so, he is a perfect savior. He's a perfect high priest. But what happens to us when we leave our eyes drift? We can't face our problems. One of those beloved stories in the Gospels. The disciples had gotten into the boat on the Sea of Galilee. were crossing over. It was night. Jesus was not with them. He came walking on the water. And what was their initial reaction, of course? They couldn't see him. It was dark. They didn't have their smartphone to shine a light or anything. It was dark. They thought he was a ghost. And he said, it is I. Do not be afraid. And of course, somebody wanted to get out of the boat and try to walk on the water. Who was that? Peter, yes. And what happened? He started to do it. He started to come to Jesus, walking on the water. And then he saw the wind in the water. And uh uh-oh, he started to go down. And Jesus said, oh, you of little faith. But what was the problem? There was no problem in the power of God to enable Peter to walk on the water too. Peter looked at the problems. He looked at the threats looming around him and looked away from Jesus, the author and perfecter of his faith. In this race, this fight of faith, you and I must look To Jesus. Continually look to him. Let us lay hold of the eternal life. To which we have been called. Why? Because the reward. And pleasures God has promised us. Are out of this world. Let's pray. Our father in heaven. We thank you. For your mercies and kindness. Toward us in Christ Jesus. And we praise you that in your wisdom you have chosen to leave us in this world to run a race, to fight, to struggle in our humanity. So that we are continually reminded of our weakness and our inability. Apart from you we can do nothing. But oh how we thank you that you have not left us as orphans. That you call us your children. That we are your sons and daughters. And you have promised you will never leave us nor forsake us. You have given us of your Holy Spirit and your power, your word. Oh, how we pray that you will help us to look to Jesus, to folks, to fix our eyes on him constantly, to hope in him, the author and perfecter of our faith. And know that you will not leave us, that you will help us. And though we may struggle fiercely, And Marf, we may go down into the water till there is but our head barely above it. But you will hold us fast if we will but hold fast to you. Help us, we pray, to fix our eyes on Jesus, to focus on him, to remember that we are in this race. But that you give us all the grace that we need to continue and persevere to the end. Oh, we pray, help us to finish and finish well. Give us the strength when we are weary and help those here today maybe who are struggling a little bit more, struggling a great deal more than the others because of something they are facing right now, maybe in their health and their family, in their work and their finances, maybe feeling discouragement because of the events going on in our nation, in the denomination. Oh Lord, we pray that you will help us to fix our eyes on you 
and have full confidence in your sovereignty, knowing and believing that nothing is out of your control and that you are causing all things, including all these difficult events, you are causing all them to work together for good. For us who love you and are called according to your purpose, strengthen your people. Remind us of your very great and precious promises, the ones we need today, tomorrow, to help us, to buoy us, to guide us. And we pray, keep us from the evil one. And we ask, oh Lord, bless this church in this community that it might be a light and that your servants here might fight the good fight of the faith, might run in the race to the very end, holding out hope in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.